Let us pray. Father, you have carried us through one year, brought us into another, and you've given us this opportunity once again to declare your message from the rooftops. Lord, give help as to speak your word to your people and to those who are not your people, calling them to be your people. Lord, edit in what you would have said, edit out what you would have dismissed. Preach a better sermon than the one that they're about to hear. And let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. For it is in the matchless mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. If you turn in your Bibles, as was just read so eloquently, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to bring a message entitled, New Year, New You in Christ. A new year, a new you in Christ. Wonderful sound of the Bible's flipping. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul deeply loved them, but he had a turbulent relationship with the Corinthian church. As you know, we have two inspired letters from Paul's hand to this uh, beleaguered church, but Paul actually wrote four letters to them. There is a previous letter to the ones we have that was a letter of instruction. Then we have 1 Corinthians that is in our Bibles. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is answering questions that this church had. But then Paul departs and he receives uh, some harsh news that the Corinthians were beginning to slip. They were beginning to fall because of some infiltrators. So he writes them a tearful or severe letter. And then finally he writes this letter that we have before us today he writes 2 Corinthians. And in this final correspondence from Paul to the Corinthians, I believe that these words are written on tear-stained paper. As Paul takes his pen in his hand, the ink pours out with all of the grief and all of the desperation of an apostle and a shepherd who speaks and urges a small minority in the church to end their rebellion against Paul, but ultimately against God himself. In the midst of this section of the letter, we find Paul in the midst of defending his apostleship. False apostles are teachers that come into Corinth saying that Paul was not who he said he was. He defends uh, both his, in, his integrity and his credentials in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 but as you come to this section specifically verses 14 through chapter 6 verse 2 we see Paul making now his appeal to these Corinthians and by extension to all of us to be reconciled to God so this is a message for everyone in this room whether you're an elder whether you are a ministry leader, whether you sing on the praise band, whether you are a student, a small child, everyone in this room, the eye is upon you. Even those who are watching online, joining us, we're looking to you this morning and asking the question, have you been reconciled to God and do you need to be reconciled to God? With the new year upon us, being that it's January, many of us desire to have a, a change in our lives. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ can give you an extreme makeover if you come to him by believing faith. He can change you not only for 2023, but even beyond. Everything in your life can be new. 
This radical transformation, friends, is only possible by the doctrine of union with Christ. It means being united with Christ, uh, becoming one with Christ. His life becomes your life. His death becomes your death. His resurrection becomes your resurrection. And, and when we are united with Christ, there's, there's a, a plenitude of, of new realities that will come into our lives. You say, great, but how do I do it? How in the world can my life go from what it is now to what God would have it to be? Here's the answer, friends. It's the main point of the sermon. Union with Christ changes everything. Union with Christ changes everything. Here we're, here's where we're going this morning. Uh, in our passage, Paul guarantees three new realities that will be present in your life if you are in Christ. First, he tells us you will have a new creation in verses 16 and 17. And then you, you will have a new relationship in verses 18 through 20. And then third and finally, you will gain a new standing, verse 21 through chapter 6, verse 2. So first, if you are in Christ, joined to him, you will have and be a new creation verses 16 and 17 this entire uh, section is rooted in verses 14 and 15 uh, what we read here is Paul's mini theology of the sacrifice of Christ and what it produces in the life of the believer in verses 14 and 15 we find out if you've read it in the past or if you want to go back and read it you need to go back and read it we find out that Christ died for all that died in him. We believe then that when we were joined with Christ in his death, we were likewise joined with Christ in his resurrection. And if you are joined with Christ in his resurrection, the Bible tells us that you walk in newness of life. You're no longer the same person that you used to be. And the Bible tells us in verses 14 and 15 that those who now live, they live in the power of Christ. They live for Christ. They make it their aim, their goal, their ambition, and whatever they do to live for him, not to live for themselves. And friends, those who are, who are in Christ, that there's an evident change that is present in their lives. There's a powerful conversion that takes place. This conversion in which there are two implications in our lives. We see it. Look at verse 16. First, there's a change in perspective on people. Verse 16 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. In the context, false apostles, I said, had come into the Corinthian church, and they were claiming that they were super apostles. They were the real thing. Paul was a fake and a phony. They were the ones that the Corinthians should have been following. These fake apostles are super apostles. They attacked Paul's calling, Paul's credentials, and ultimately they attacked Paul's apostleship itself. Perhaps they were saying things like, Paul wasn't around when John baptized Jesus. Paul wasn't around when Jesus was walking the streets of Palestine and doing good things. Who called him and where did he come from? Why were they saying these things about Paul? Well, because Paul didn't look the part. Paul was not a nice looking man. We, we believe Paul had some sort of eye disease, some kind of eye distortion that made him look odd. They said that his, his appearance was weak and his speech was contemptible. He did not speak like the great orators of the day. They were judging Paul according to the flesh. They viewed Paul as unimpressive. But friends, in light of the atonement of Christ Jesus and the new birth from the Spirit, let it not be so among us that we regard people according to the flesh. 
Let's not be impressed by what people look like, where people come from, and what people have. Let's not be that way. We must only see people as in one or two categories. They are either saved or lost. Friends, if you view everyone that you see as either saved or lost, it will affect everything about your life. It will affect how you choose leaders in a church. It will affect how you view your family, how you view your friends, and how you even view complete strangers. Let us not be impressed by what the world is impressed by. You students, it's great to have heroes. It's great to have people who entertain us and we love to, to see them. Let us not be impressed by how much money they have, how cool they are, or how much uh, success they have had. Let, let us ask ourselves, does this person know Jesus Christ? First, that is going to be the number one thing that's going to matter on Judgment Day. Do you know Christ? Paul is saying, listen, when we are in Christ, we need to view everybody as those who are in need of saving faith. Everyone. This change of perspective on people leads to and results in a change of perspective on Christ. Paul writes, look at it, verse 16, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Paul admits, listen, I was once guilty of this too. I was once sizing people up and estimating them according to the flesh. Paul speaks here autobiographically of the days when he was a, a lost Pharisee, his B.C. days. He, he saw Christ as a heretical leader of a false movement, a coward who made boasts and claims of being the Son of God, the Messiah, but who didn't do anything that he claimed he was going to do. Paul expected a Messiah who would come in as a conquering king and overthrow the Romans, but Jesus came and he died. And Paul was excited that he died. Paul had hoped that by the death of Christ upon the cross, it would put an end to this movement called the way, what we call Christianity. But since it didn't happen when Jesus died, Paul concluded, I will put an end to it myself. Speaking of his pre-conversion days, in Acts chapter 26, verse 9, Paul says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposition to, to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. How about you, friends? Those of you who are true believers, how did you once look at Christ according to the flesh? Uh, many of us may not have been as zealous as Paul to put an end to Christianity, but we did do what Isaiah 53 says. We despised him. To despise someone means to ignore him, to pay him no attention. I remember going to church week after week after week. I heard the gospel over and over again. I was telling someone I thought Charles Stanley was my grandfather because I watched him every single morning on Sunday as we got ready for church then I would go hear my uncle stand and proclaim the gospel in front of all of these people and week by week I just despised him I looked at him according to the flesh according to the flesh means from a, a human point of view he's just a man this Jesus guy I mean he's kind of cool I mean we celebrate his birthday and we get all these nice gifts He's all right, but we do have to get up early on Easter morning to go to a sunrise service, but we do get breakfast. I looked at him as just a man. And Paul said, I looked at him as a man also, but on the Damascus Road, armed with papers in his hand to go grab every Christian he could find and bring them back to Jerusalem and cast them into the jail, beat them, and cast the ultimate vote for their death. He said, I met the living Christ I was riding down the road and suddenly I seen a light in the sky a light that was brighter than 10,000 suns and the stars above and that light blinded me and I was thrown down to the ground 
And I heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He says, who art thou? Here's the change, Lord. Once I had that encounter with Jesus Christ, everything changed. Everything changed about Saul, even his own name. Friends, nobody can have an encounter with the risen Christ and not have their lives changed. It is not enough to simply say you believe the gospel. There needs to be an evident change in your life. And this is what Paul says. Here's the change, and you know where it comes from? It comes from Christ. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone, stop right there. Two of the most beautiful words in the Bible. If anyone. You don't have to be the most moral person. You don't have to be someone that the world looks up to. You could have sinned your entire life and been in total rebellion against Christ and against God. But if anyone. This is like Paul's John 3.16. The offer's open to anyone. Oh, but preacher, you don't know how bad I've been. <laughs> you don't know the places I've been, the things I've done, the folks I've hung with. You just don't understand. He, he couldn't possibly save me. Do you receive my text? If you have a Bible, please have it open and look at chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse 17, and tells me what it says. It says, therefore, if anyone... That includes you, my friend. I don't care where you find yourself this morning, but anyone includes me, and it includes you. If anyone is in Christ, I think the glue that holds this entire section together is that little phrase, in Christ. There's profound mysteries tied up in that little phrase, and time does not permit us to explore it. But just understand that everything you get in salvation comes to you because you are in Christ. Notice he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The new has come. I love the way that phrase is rendered. It speaks of an action that takes place in the past but has ongoing, ongoing effects. Yes, there was a time when you are converted and saved, but that is not the conclusion of your salvation, friends. Salvation comes to us in stages. We were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved in the end. And this new creation, it starts in the, the time of your conversion when you submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then effects of that continue throughout your life, which means you will get progressively more and more holy, more and more like Christ. And then on that final day, when you receive your resurrection body, you will be totally free from sin, and you will be fully new creation but you can have that right now friends you can have that today you can be new I love this word new you see it in your, in your Bible in verse 17 the word new here it, it speaks of this word new speaks of new in kind or the, the, the latest it speaks of new in kind or, or type it, it does another word for for new in in the New Testament speaks of like the latest thing that has come in has come out. The other word for new it, it speaks of the latest F two fifty that comes off the assembly line. Our word for new in this passage it speaks of the Wright brothers or the Model T. It, it is something that the world has never seen before. And if you are in Christ, friends, he will make you something that is so uh, transformed that the world has never seen it before. They won't even recognize you. He will make you new, friends. New ambitions, new goals, entirely new. I trust that this has happened in your life this morning that you have a testimony a real testimony not a dead testimony that you have a life before Christ you have a life at the moment of meeting Christ 
and then you have a life after Christ. I pray that the old you, the sinful you, the old man that was you has died and passed away and that a new you now stands in your place. Now here's how you start to determine whether that's happening or not. Can anyone in your life observe a distinct difference in you? Has there been any evidences of grace that Christ has came and transformed your life? My friends, the text says, I'm going to draw your attention to it again, if anyone, the offer is wide open. If anyone is in Christ, if you're not in Christ this morning, we urge you and we plead with you to come and accept Christ. Find me after the service. Find one of the elders after the service. Find uh, a church member, anyone uh, in this building who's a member of Freedom Church, or, or ask the person who invited you this morning, and, and I'm sure one of us will lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. We would not leave this place until you can leave saying, I am a new creation. Once that happens, friends, this, this is the beauty of the gospel. Secondly, you can become... You can have a new relationship. Verses 18 through 20. This remarkable transformation that we just talked about in verses 16 and 17. The, you, the new you has its roots, friends, in regeneration. Fancy term, which means simply the new birth or being born again. The 18th century evangelist George Whitfield armed with the King James Bible and sermon notes would jump on the back of his horse and he would ride from town to town and sometimes he would go to the same place and the gist of his message if you wanted to sum it up was you must be born again he say I come here to talk about your souls this morning you must be born again one woman who was frustrated with Whitfield one day came to him and said Mr. Whitfield why do you keep telling us you must be born again he said, because, dear ma'am, you must be born again. It's true then. It's true today. If you're here this morning, you must be born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless you are born from above, you will not see the kingdom of God. Friends, you must have something transformative happen in your life. But how can we be born again? That's a good question, isn't it? I remember being a, a little boy, and, and I've seen a, a book from a famous evangelist, and the title of that book was How to Be Born Again. I thought to myself, what, what, that's, that's a question to ask. What, what are the steps? How, how do we make it happen? Friends, let me give you the answer, and it's going to shock you. Listen, there are no steps. You cannot make yourself born again. Let me ask you something. You think about it. How involved were you in your physical birth? You weren't. You cannot do this in your own power. Verse 18, what does he say? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation he said it is all from God from start to finish and by God Paul here has the whole trinity in his mind the father initiates and plans this salvation in eternity past the son accomplishes this salvation on the cross and the spirit of God in time applies this salvation to your life so all of this all of what verses 16 and 17 the fact that you no longer regard people according to the flesh the fact that you no longer regard God Christ according to the flesh and the fact that you are a new creation all of this is from God but here though in verse 18 I think Paul's eye is especially drawn upon God the Father who, don't miss it, in Christ. In Christ, God does two things. First, he reconciled us 
This, this us here refers to all believers. He, he, he reconciled us. That this word reconciled is, in, is really an invented word. Paul makes up this word, taking two words put together. Uh, one of these words means establishing, reestablishing a broken relationship. The other part of the word says that we now become friends. God and man at war with one another now have become friends. And just so you understand, the hostility was on man's side, not God. How do we know? Because God is offering himself to reconcile to men. Man was the one who had a problem with God. Now, I love you, friends. You may be here today and you think, I don't have a problem with God. I don't even think about God. Or, I don't even believe in God. Listen, it doesn't matter if you don't have a problem with God. God has a problem with you. Because you have sinned and you have broken his laws. This is a holy God. A, a holy God. Therefore, he expects holy living. And if you violate one of God's laws, you will violate all of his law and you will be justly condemned for it. We were being hostile to God. But look at what God done. If you're taking notes, you can write this down or you can turn in your Bibles. Romans chapter six, Romans chapter five, verses six through eight. I'm going to show you something. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight. And we're going to see what God done. I just want you to follow the thought with me. Notice that we had an, a breach with God, a, a, a broken down relationship with God and look at what God does verse 6 of Romans chapter 8 for while we were still here it is weak helpless unable to do anything for ourselves while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly friends we were weak meaning we couldn't do anything on our own we were ungodly, which means we had no want for God, no need for God. We disdained God, but still, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would one die for a good man. But even for a righteous man, one might dare to die. There, there, there may be military buddies who, who would give their life up for a fellow, a fellow soldier on, on the battlefield. There, there, there may be some who, who, who would do it for somebody who they deem to be good or more valued than they. I, I would give up my life if someone came into the house and they were trying to kill my wife or, or my children. Uh, he said some people might die for a decent person, but God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, verse 8, Christ died for us. While we were kicking God in the face, he died for us. While we were running in our own direction, doing our own thing, it is then that God died for you. It wasn't when you were at your best. God does not come to you because you are doing well. God comes to you when you are sick and he makes you well. Oh, this is what God done. Friend, reconciliation is the beauty of the gospel. That we were unworthy sinners. But God takes the initiative and he creates a relationship between him and between us. And just hear me well. Reconciliation is both vertical and horizontal. God reaches down and he creates this, this new relationship between us and him. All through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He creates this new relationship. And friends, when this new relationship comes to us, it should affect our relationships with one another. I wonder how many in this room today, as you start a new year off, I wonder how many in this room have somebody they need to be reconciled with. Someone that, that you know you need to call today. In fact, it's the person that just popped into your mind as I said that. You've held on to a grudge for too long. We cannot claim to love God and say that we can't be reconciled to somebody. It's like, well, you just don't know what they've done to me. You're right, I don't. 
And I don't take it lightly what they've done to you. However, I do know what you've done to God. And the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Extend that forgiveness. Reconcile with that person. Call them on the phone. Extend forgiveness. Ask forgiveness if you are the wrong, the wrong, the party that wronged someone. Do whatever you can to fix this relationship because it will show that this reconciliation from God has had an effect on your life. This work of reconciliation, I want you to notice, is open to the whole world. Verse 19 says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. <clears throat> God is reconciling the world to himself, not every individual in the world, because every individual in the world does not get saved. What he means by world here is everyone without distinction, not everyone without exception. In other words, Jew and Gentile, black and white, old or young, boy or girl, rich or poor, everyone in the whole world. That this offer is available to them. And how is he reconciling? By not counting their trespasses against them. That word counting, obviously, is a mathematical term. It's really a financial term. It's like a budget where you got one column with assets and one col column with liabilities. Uh, God is not transferring all of your liabilities to you. We are guilty of sin, but he's not counting that sin against us. Why? Because of the work of his son. He's reconciled the world to himself. And now so he entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. The us here, his original context refers to Paul and his companions. That'll be important in just a moment, but it's, it's, it's referring specifically to Paul and, and to the ministry, uh, to his team. He, he's given us the message of reconciliation or the word of reconciliation, and it extends down to our modern-day ministers, which is why I'm standing on this platform, and I'm urging all of us to be reconciled to God. Paul elaborates this in verse 20. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That word ambassador means we are Delegates from a kingdom. We represent a king and we bring a message from that king. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now notice I said in context, uh, this us, this we, it really is Paul talking about himself. It is a way of being humble, we. Kind of like when the king or the queen makes a declaration and they say we, but they really mean them. Paul means we, as in we who are ambassadors for Christ. That word ambassador comes from a word that sounds like the word for elders. He's speaking here of an office, those who have been set out and called to give this message. I think sometimes when we do application first without doing inter interpretation, we get in trouble. Because this is a word, I think, first of all, for you men in this church who are leaders of this church. It goes for all the staff pastors. It goes for all of the lay elders. It goes for every single person who has this task to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. James tells us that those who desire to be teachers will face a stricter judgment. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ. It means something. Don't, don't enter into this task lightly. But I think by application, it applies to all of us in this room who are members of this church and who are blood-bought members of the body of Christ. We implore you. We urge you. We beg you. We come alongside of you. <clears throat> On behalf of Christ, we say, be reconciled to God. You can supply you there. It would be clunky, but the point Paul is making here is that you, you need to be reconciled to God. This is an imperative command. This is not a suggestion. This is not just a good idea. No, you must be reconciled to God. 
You must take action to make sure this happens. Friends, we talked about in verse 18 that all of this is from God, but don't get it twisted. There is still a responsibility that each one of us have. You need to be reconciled to God. God has done this work of reconciliation. Now you, you must make the decision to follow Christ. But before we move on, who is Paul talking to in this passage? I want you to look at it. Ask yourself, who is Paul talking to? Well, I believe Paul is talking here to lost church members. I say this with, with trepidation, but I say this with love. As I read, as I read commentators this week, I, none of them would say it. None, none of them would say it. But, you know, Paul's not, these Corinthians, you know, they're believers, but when Paul says be reconciled to God, he really means, like, fix their relationship or, like, you know, whatever, whatever. But no, 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 no. They, I said, must have never been a pastor before. No, I believe in Corinth there were lost church members, people who profess Christ but do not possess Christ. I do think it was a minority of, of the members at Corinth but friends, we just have to say it, even in Freedom Church, church that, that is healthy and sound, I'm, I'm fearful that there are lost church members in our midst. You've taken the membership class, you've submitted the testimony, you've stood before the people, you may have even went down in the water, but there's been no change in your life. And a New Year's resolution is not going to get it, friend. If there's been no change, perhaps there is no salvation. Perhaps. Now, I want to quickly add that I think we should have assurance of salvation if we are fully believers. And I know that some people struggle with assurance. And if you do struggle with assurance, that's why God has given you spiritual leaders in the church. Sit down with someone and talk to them and try to find out whether or not you have assurance of a real salvation or if you have false assurance of a false salvation. The Bible uses many metaphors for salvation. The delivery room, we've seen that in the first two verses with regeneration or new birth. The social dimension that we just seen in verses 18 through 20, that's reconciliation. And then finally here in the third point we're going to see the courtroom scenario, which is justification. I love this passage. Justification, which answers the question, how can a, a holy God stand with sinners? And I'm going to tell you, friends, you need a mediator. You need someone to stand between you and God. And you know what? That mediator needs to be able to equally represent both sides. He needs to be God so that he can put his hand on the holy God, but he needs to be man in order that he can put his hand on sinful man and bring the two together. And that, friends, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, point three as we get ready to leave this place. You can gain a new standing. Verses 21 through 6, uh, 2, Paul brings this unit to its appropriate end having issued the command to be reconciled in verse 20 he now gives the ground for it in verse 21 and then he will close with an even stronger invitation verse 21 for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God for our sake, he, who's he? God. He, God, made him Christ to be sin on our behalf. What does it mean that he made him to be sin? Well, in other words, it means that, that Christ, who had no experience with, with sin, that's what it means by he knew no sin, who never committed sin, who was sinless in of himself, he is treated as if he was the worst sinner who ever lived upon the cross. He knew no sin, but he's treated as the worst sinner ever so that in him we might be treated as if we were the most righteous people ever. In other words, this is the great exchange, friends. The worst of us laid upon Christ. The best of Christ laid upon us. 
As you read of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating uh, drops of blood. He's crying. He's in desperation. It is not because he's afraid to die. Friends, it is not because in his human state, I've heard people say that over and over, in his human state, he was afraid to die. Friends, I've read biographies about men who marched to the stake. I've read biographies about men who when the, when the fire was lit, they washed their hands in the fire. You tell me they've got that much confidence to die and Jesus Christ, the sinless, holy one, was afraid to die physically? I don't believe so. In Jesus' divine nature, it is this contact with sin in which made him not want to go to the cross. The Holy One is tainted with sin. He's, he's, he's embraced sin and treated as if he was the one who sinned. And who did he do it for? He did it for us, those who belong to him. This is the ground for this invitation. The fact of the matter is, none of us deserve this invitation, but this is the ground for it. The righteousness that you need to get in heaven is outside of you. It is the righteousness of Christ. Friends, I want to say something very shocking. What this passage teaches us in verse 21 is that we are saved by works. But not our works. We're saved by the works of another. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, the life that we should have lived. And because he earned, he merited the righteousness of God, it is then transferred to you if you become a Christian. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This is the, cl the close, the climactic appeal. Verse 1, working together then. Working together with God. Paul says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. There are disagreements on what it means to receive the grace of God in vain. It, it could refer to not receiving the grace of God without it giving a change that is produced in your life. If that's the case, all of us in this room who are believers, we need to hear that. But it also can mean don't receive the grace of God in vain, that you've heard the gospel over and over, and yet you have done nothing with it. Friends, do you have that tingling in your body? That little voice in your head is telling you, maybe I need to do this friend listen to that voice it is nothing other than God himself don't receive this gospel in vain you hear it week after week if you come to this place do not receive it in vain and then Paul in verse 2 quotes from Isaiah 49 verse 8 in a favorable time I've heard you and he says that now is the day of salvation. Paul quotes Isaiah 49, 8, because Isaiah, like Paul, was called by God, but the people that who he was talking to were not listening to him. And yet, he was still urging and pleading with them, especially those who were in Babylon, to come back to God. Paul is likewise appealing to those of us in the room who may be church members and who are lost, and those who are, of us who are outside of the church but who are lost. He is appealing to us to come to him, Christ, by faith right now. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, now. Not next Sunday, now. Not when Andrew preaches. I like Andrew, you know. I really like him. Or, or Aaron. Or I really like Michael. No, no, now. <laughs> now. Now is the day. And since you're now here in this room in your seats, now is the time. It's today. Isaiah called it a favorable time. In other words, tomorrow may not be favorable. 
God gets fed up. His grace will run out. Tomorrow your heart might be even harder than it is today. Today you might show some interest. Tomorrow you may have no interest. You need to come to Christ and you need to come to Christ today. All of us. Well, I've already come to Christ. Well, listen, friends. You need to keep coming to Christ. You need to keep following Christ. All of us have areas in our lives that we need to grow in. None of us can say, oh, we witness too much, oh, we pray too much, or we just read the Bible way too much. No, friends, you need to come to Christ continuously. The gospel is for unsaved and for saved alike. It is the gospel by which we were saved and the gospel in which we stand. And what I love about God so much is though our sins are many, his mercy is so much more. And he extends that mercy to anyone in this room who would be willing to come to Christ by faith. How do we come? As I get ready to walk off this stage, I want to instruct you. Because some of us have come from different places and and there were different practices at the churches that we come from. They're like, how do I come to church, uh, to, to faith in Christ? There's no public invitation. There's no walking. And I'll, how, how do I do this? Well, let, me, let me give you some, some, some instructions. Right now in your seat, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means bow your head, ask Christ to save you. He delights to save. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And then when this service ends, come find me, come find someone in this church and tell them I have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we will give you further instructions from there. That getting up is just an outward symbol. It's not salvation. A lot of people have gotten up and they're still lost. And a lot of people have gotten baptized but they just got wet. You need to make sure you have Christ Jesus for yourself before you leave this church today. Now, friends, and if you do this right now, you will be a new creation. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the chance to proclaim your word. Lord, I pray that this word would have its effect. For some, it'll be an aroma of life to life, and others, an aroma of death to death. Lord, I pray for the unbeliever in the room who knows they need to come to faith in Christ now, today. I pray for the church member in the room who, though they can recite the songs and they can say the right things, know in their heart they are not believing in Christ for salvation. Work in their hearts, work in my heart, work in all of our hearts, that we make our calling and election sure. I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.